we have here so the sounds coming through should be all right uh, okay so today we are going to be digging into this course on managing the experience i've been teaching this course for years actually at uh, various employers um First at OGD, where I learned a lot about this uh, this stuff. Uh, then later at Tivetro, and uh, now at Seedling. So I've I've done a bunch of these. Uh, I really like this course. It usually really brings a lot of new insight to people about customer experience, uh, how to measure it, how to manage it, and uh, so that's a, that's a very nice uh, thing to to get around to. Okay, let's go check on our sound here. Recapturing anything doesn't seem like it. Okay, so we're gonna fix the sound first. Okay, I do see it appear here in the streaming software. I don't hear it coming out of my laptop. I've got my little, uh, my little laptop set up here to uh, kind of monitor the stream, see what comes out on the other side. Um, obviously, we have some technical issues to correct. Kind of funny to see myself. So right now I'm digging into the settings for the audio capture on this webcam. Maybe I should kind of drag it up in a like order of precedence kind of deal. It should be part of the webcam source. Hey, webcam source, what's up? Here's custom audio device. We got the Rode podcast console going here. Hmm. Why does this computer actually make other sounds? Is this a different YouTube movie? Or is it not the issue? Might be an output issue. That is interesting. So then the question becomes what's going on with this computer that it's not giving me the audio? Sounds like a pro speaker. Okay, so now can I hear myself on the stream? That's an interesting question. Yeah, there we go. Well, there you have it, folks. It's very important to make sure that what you're using to validate your output is actually also working correctly. Okay, so let's see. We are all good to go. Let us pop the green screen down here. This is my uh, 
uh, Elgato green screen. It's really useful to in post processing, um, you know, enable different backgrounds, show um, what's going to happen. Oh, this is fascinating. The green screen seems to be affecting my webcam. Oh, wow. That is so cool. But it's also unintentional, so let's fix that. Filters, chroma key, drop the chroma key. There, that's better. Now you see me do it. Why? I was kind of hoping you'd see me. Um, so just briefly going over the setup here, um, we have the main screen up here, with the high definition camera and the, and the ring light. Um, and that will be feeding into a, a capture card in the computer. And that's where we'll be making our main recording today. Um, over here on the right, we have um, the description of the course that I'm, uh, I'm doing work on today. Let's see if I can zoom that a little for you guys. Nope, making the frame bigger doesn't help. That does make it bigger, definitely does make it prettier. border on that something like this actually never mind just gonna roll without the border there okay that'll do um so we are working on a series of video lectures uh, which also include online mentor sessions community sessions and uh, learning challenges and um, so there's different things going on here and part of the materials I have to pre-record. So today I'm going to be recording an introduction. I'm going to be recording some uh, parts of the actual course. Um, and then later there's going to be slides added into that, other videos, um, links to, to various course materials. So this is really what they call in video production photography, actually primary photography. Um, where you point the camera at someone who's, you know, they're talking and uh, doing stuff um, to gather the raw materials that then later go into the production process. Um, let's see if we can at least get to the introduction and maybe some stuff for um, the first module. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. We have the camera set up here and I have focus on the main camera. That looks okay, that looks okay. Yeah. I think the light is fairly even. It's a bit pale, but I can correct for that later. stand here without really casting a shadow on the green screen because that makes it really tricky to then later um, change the background. So this is okay. Yeah. So let me take you guys through the setup here in the small screen. Well, as I, uh, as I showed before, I have a, a laptop here which allows me to monitor. I have the main computer screen where uh, I have the various uh, things going on. So this is the, the streaming software. 
then here I have Notion where I maintain my notes in. And this is uh, the Elgato capture program, which just shows the image from the main camera. And then over here we have the Rode podcast console, um, which is set up just right. So I have this cap on it, so I don't knock any of the faders around accidentally. Now over here is the computer ingesting and rendering all this stuff in uh, in real time. So it's a, it's a powerful beast that's capable of uh, of doing that. Here I have my little. Uh, Seedling Sharpest Thought uh, collaboration mug that we made for the coffee talks. Cheers. Just rolling with water. I had plenty of coffee this morning. And now uh, it's time to just, you know, hydrate. I'm going to lower the volume on the Mac. I do believe that you can hear me now. And enough of my own croaky voice. So now I'm going to have to do something a little bit tricky. I'm going to have to stack the microphone in such a way that um, the little table I have here doesn't show on camera, but um, that the sound recording is really clear. Um, so we're going to do that. I do have an arm coming in, which allows me to do this a little bit more flexibly and professionally. But since it's not here yet, we're going to roll with a little improvisation. Okay. There we go. Okay. Let's see. I seem out of focus. Let's see if we can fix that. Okay, so we're going to now focus a little bit beyond the microphone. I'm going to put my chair back here. Just about where the head would be. And then I'm going, it's a neat trick, to focus on something with writing on it. Like this box of... Pringles. And then if I can see that really clearly, that means that the camera is just in perfectly in focus. Okay. It's a bit tricky for the camera because there's a microphone and there's there's different things going on there that it could focus on. So I'm gonna change the focus to manual and then make sure that it's uh, right. So see now I'm too close. Now I'm going to focus right and then over here. It should be really, really sharp. Okay. Actually, my dear wife spent a lot of time to make me look this pretty. Um, what did she say? She said something hilarious. She said... She said something like, I can see something. It alliterated under the scruff. Like, well, thank you very much. Um, but yes, this is okay. There, I think the light is right. I think the sound should be just fine. So we can get to it. Okay, I'm gonna start the recording here. point onwards we're both streaming and recording so this is going to be very interesting for the computer let's see how it does um earlier i had a lot of issues with um the computer kind of dying basically when it was trying to do streaming and anything else but with this upgraded workstation things should move a lot smoother um so we'll see how that goes. Okay, there's going to be a number of takes here. I'm going to be starting and restarting my pitch. And then once I have the feeling that I have a good take on video, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to keep the live stream going. Uh, we might be interrupted at some point by kids walking in. This is a work from home situation. Uh, we might be interrupted by the mailman with the um, the 
studio arm that the mic fits on. So bear with me. Um, let's see. We're going to talk about experience management. You know, teleprompter seems stupid until you're in this kind of situation where you actually have to uh, deliver some text. Okay, here we go. Experience is a key aspect of your product or service and the reason people want, buy and tell others about it. Learn how to design for and manage the experience of your product or service in such a way that it only becomes better and better over time, not just by any gold metrics like uptime or availability or whatever, but in improving the customer experience. This is going to make a world of difference to your business in the long run. Other businesses do this on a daily basis, ranging from airlines to software companies to uh, ride sharing services. They continuously A, B test customer experiences. They know how to measure not only what their product or service does, but how it helps their customers achieve certain outcomes. They relentlessly optimize to stay ahead of the competition and amaze customers on a daily basis. In this four week course you will learn to do the same for your business we are going to take you through the relevant schools of thought uh, metrics measurements reporting how to then act based on that reporting and how to think about customer experience in a holistic and effective way you're going to be joining your classmates in discussion groups to deepen your understanding of the material and learn how they are seeing Uh, how it applies to their situation, which can bring a lot of insight. There's going to be some, not tests, but like some essay writing and some showing how you would be implementing the lessons learned in your own business, which at the end of the course gives you an actionable nine-part plan uh, to get started and uh, to make the difference for your business. So it's not just something you learn, it's really something you get to start doing during this course. I really hope to see you there. Let me know what you think because of course I'm optimizing for your experience and this course is going to get better and better and better over time because we practice what we preach. See you there. Okay. The claps. The claps are important. The claps allow me uh, to find the beginning and the end of a segment Um, in the waveform really quickly. So when I load a bunch of uh, video material into the um, nonlinear editor into Premiere Pro, I can just find these segments really quickly, delete what's before and after it, and then kind of see um, if it's any good. If I want to keep it, I can give it some tags. Um, So that's how I quickly build up segments of material that actually will be carried forward into production. So and, and th- that's that's what the claps are all about. I think that was not a bad take, actually. It wasn't quite a one take, but um, it had everything I wanted in there. Maybe not as smoothly delivered as I would have liked, but uh, maybe you can tell that I have some experience with this uh, experience management uh, courses because um, I more or less have it all cached um, it's harder for new materials to just deliver uh, um, a take in one go like that uh, all right so let's see i'm just gonna check if the capture was done well okay there is five minutes of material captured <laughs> it's called my great capture. My doctor knows how to optimize with that kind of tool. Okay, okay, okay. Still on the full thing. Trying to uh, 
new play that I just recorded on my camera feed and it's actually interesting to see if I can see that with my new song. Okay, so that didn't seem to go too well. Um, important, important thing, levels of redundancy. So stream is working. I still have the recording of that, hopefully. But also uh, both the podcast console and the camera have a memory chip inside with some gigabytes of free space. So uh, right now we're going to do a retake. And I'm going to be turning on the recording inside the camera and um, inside the podcast console as well. Um, now, the advantage to that is that I can be really quite certain I have a, a high quality capture. The downside is that I'm going to have to load those in separately and uh, synchronize them. And it's, it's a bit more of a hassle. I mean, their timestamps are not perfect. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely plan B. I was hoping to get a good first time, right? Capture out of this, uh, Elgato capture utility. And it may be that I'm doing something wrong with the library management and the playback. And I actually do have a good capture. However, right now, unable to verify that I do, um, there's only one thing for it. Uh, try again and use a different method as well. So definitely um, recommend it to always use multiple ways to capture and store whatever you're doing. Um, because otherwise you might end up with empty hands to show for your busy afternoon. Let's see. So camera's rolling. Podcast console is rolling. Take a quick let off. Okay. Find out the capture software. Start recording. Try again. All right. Here we are. Experience is a key aspect of any product or service that makes people want it, buy it, and tell other people all about it. In this course, you learn the art and science of designing for and managing the experience that your product or service gives to customers. This allows you to make it better every day, not just by cold and hard metrics like the availability or the reach of your marketing campaign, but by how much of a difference it makes to your customers. This is used by really different companies like airlines, software companies, ride sharing companies to make sure that they continue to amaze, satisfy and gain new customers who get it through word of mouth. Experience management has been around for quite a while and there are a number of excellent reporting tools, uh, ways to guide your decision making, etc. to make sure that your product or service is amazing. 
in this four week course, we're going to take you through that. We're going to tell you some of the theoretical background, hand you the practical tools to implement it in your business. And during this course, you will not only be watching these video materials, doing some exercises, but you're also going to be having discussions with your group mates that will deepen your understanding by comparing it with theirs. Additionally, you're going to, in the course of your assignments, create a nine point action plan that once you're done with this course, you are ready to roll and you have something very concrete to report in your business about what you've learned and now how that is going to make a world of difference to your business. I really hope to see you there. I love giving this course. I've been doing it for years for different companies. And um, as you can probably tell, we are using our own theories in practice and I want to hear from you how we can make this thing even better, what it's doing for you, which goals it helps you achieve, and how we can continue to do better for you now and in the future. Thank you very much. See you there. Okay, so that's the second take. Uh, right now we have, uh, I see on the podcast console that there's a three-minute recording running um probably on the camera it's the same thing so this gives me a lot more confidence that i have a good uh, capture now i'm going to stop these okay that's the main camera that's on the podcast console and then on the picture software The whole thing, probably when I clip off before and after the clip, is about two minutes. Ideally, I want these segments to be about 100 seconds. Um, that is long enough to tell a message, short enough not to waste anybody's time. Um, if you want to share on social, like LinkedIn, um, this, is, this is a reasonable sized clip. Uh, I've recently seen some excellent work by the Swedish journalist, writer, and public speaker, Andreas Ekstrom, where he does 100 seconds on a certain topic. And these are these are great clip lines. So that's, uh, that's what I'm aiming for uh, here on this kind of um, um, introduction video, you could say, to the, to the course. Um, now let's see. We will need to go into some video recording on the actual materials. Let's see what's happening in the chat. Thank you for watching my short interaction. That's fine. Oh, this is neat. I can put my cup down here. It's not actually on camera. But it is on the same surface as the microphone, so I can't knock into it because that's going to be heard. So I can't just reach for it during what I'm saying. Maybe it's best to keep it out of reach. Then, you know. Easier to avoid a mistake than to not make it if it's so easy. Um... All right, I think I'm going to be recording the segment now about Gramercy Tavern, KLM, and Granite Rock, which is part of the first video on the first uh, course week. Um, I'm not going to do the whole thing in one take. I'm going to be doing the kind of the opening segment because during most of that course video it's going to be slides with just my voice so i can record that sitting down as a as an audio take i don't have to do uh, the whole video setup for that but the opening i think it's a good thing to uh, to do now all right again same thing so fire up the camera recording there then start the audio recording there Okay, 
My streaming software doesn't want to do the primary recording. Okay, fair enough. I'm not going to dig into that now because we're live and I don't want to make you all think. Wait for it. Now, the capture utility is running, podcast consoles running, cameras running. All right. Welcome. Today I'm going to tell you about three totally different companies with totally different ways to think about, measure and act on customer experience. First up is Gramercy Tavern. This is a legendary restaurant in New York, a city notoriously harsh on restaurants, which has uh, stood the test of time and has amazed customers again and again. And everybody who's been there is raving about it. So what's their secret? Um, well, one thing that they do there, which they do at all the restaurants of this uh, founder, I'll, I'll put a link, um, he's pretty famous for it, is he puts together teams of people that really take care of each other. They really share the mission of giving people an incredible experience when they come there. And they really try to support each other because they're convinced that if they're strong as a team, they're going to do better at their jobs and for their customers. This is unlike many other restaurants, which can be really, really tough environments for employees um, in order to uh, uh, amaze and wow their, their customers. And I think this approach is different, it's telling, and it's proven to be effective. So at Gramercy Tavern, they really look at the employee instead of the customer in order to optimize the customer's experience. This is quite an exceptional thing, an interesting perspective to have. At airline KLM, they have a different way of looking at it. Here they look at the airplane and they talk about under wing and above wing services, which is very interesting metaphor because of course in an airplane, all the really technical stuff, boring stuff is under the wing. The engines, you just want them to work perfectly every time, right? Um, baggage handling has to be quick, it has to be flawless, you know. Um, all that stuff, refueling, taking care of the plane, the landing gear, that is below wing stuff. And they say that should never negatively affect uh, the customer experience. It should be measured in such a way that um, any issues that occur below the wing have to be handled without any impact to the customer experience above wing. Now, above wing, there's a different story. There you can start optimizing and maximizing for things. That's where the people come into the airplane, they're greeted, uh, how are they seated, in what order, uh, how much space do they have, uh, food, drinks, service, um, how the announcements are handled, how the whole, you know, uh, safety video is done. And all of these things are above wing experiences and they have separate ways to measure and manage under wing and above wing. So it's very interesting for you to think about your business and think about where that cutoff point is. Which are the things that you want to do really well so that the customer never notices and uh, which are the things that you want to do well that the customer notices and is delighted by and to measure and, and guide those things in different ways then there's granite rock this is a very old example this one's actually from the book good to great by jim collins which is a management science classic um, granite rock had this really cool red flag mechanism so they deliver goods and services to customers and then the customers are allowed to pay what they think it was worth. Of course, there's prices quoted, um, but if there's anything out of line for any reason, the customer is allowed to circle that item in red on the invoice and pay the remainder and they'll get back to that customer and say, okay, so 
what what happened why weren't you satisfied but this gives such a strong impulse to a company to satisfy each and every time they deliver a product or service to customer because it affects the bottom line really directly and i think this is a very courageous way to think about quality so keep those things in mind Gramercy tavern focus on the team klm above wing and under wing thinking and granite rock if it's not good it doesn't get paid for it red flag mechanism in your face these three ways of looking at customer experience have really affected the way i look at it myself and are usually hugely informative in the group discussions so i'm really curious to see what you guys come up with okay so that was a decent segment it wasn't super um if i listen to myself i'm not fully satisfied about the tempo of my voice about the delivery and that's also a mindset thing so i started uh, recording a more or less promotional segment and now i went into a informative segment and these have a very different energy different message right in the first one trying to convince you to buy the course and in the second one i'm supposed to be teaching but i did the second segment with the same kind of uh, uh, energy as the first one and that's not okay so uh, i have to redo that and i have to work on building understanding rather than building enthusiasm speak in a calmer voice speak slower leave longer pauses between the words and sentences and make it a segment that allows you to think about it while i'm delivering it notice the difference there okay so let's take a sip let's try again ah oh, man water so good cold cold water okay Welcome. Today, we're going to talk about three very different companies and the very different and unorthodox ways that they have to measure and manage their customer experience. I really enjoy telling these stories because they always lead to a lot of discussion in groups afterwards, and they've personally brought me a lot of insight. Uh, over the years in different applications of these ideas so first off is a new york restaurant known as gramercy tavern this restaurant is famous not only for its longevity in a city famous for its harsh critics and very very tough uh, to please crowd um, but gramercy tavern is a classic and everybody who's been there raves about it they tell all their friends they want to take their family for special occasions this is one of those places that really has got that magic touch so what is that it turns out it's actually not a focus on the customer primarily but a focus on the team at gramercy tavern and other restaurants by the same founder which i'll put a link to in the in the notes um they really focus on team, on getting the right people on board and to train them to be very supportive of each other and to share that mission of delivering a great experience to the customer. Which is funny, right? To have the effect of putting the customer at the center of everything. What you actually do is to build a, cu a culture where the employee is at the center of everything. I don't think this applies in every situation, but I really think it's a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, it's not easy to run a New York restaurant. It's not easy to find and retain the people. And it's definitely not easy to have multiple years of, of incredibly high, what's called a net promoter score, which we'll talk about later. 
um, of people telling all their friends to come there as soon as they can. So, Gramercy Tavern, remember the name. Then there's a very different company that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about an airline, and not Virgin, which, you know, in customer experience and airlines is the usual example. We're going to talk about the KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines. They have a philosophy of looking at customer experience and um, aligning their metrics and quality management uh, around a very interesting division. The wings of the airplane. The KLM looks at what happens below the wing, and what happens above wing through different eyes. If you think about it, everything below wing of an airplane is absolutely critical stuff and you want it to go right absolutely every time. The engines, the refueling, the baggage loading off and on. This is what you basically never want to notice um, except by it going really well and smoothly and perfectly every time. Now above wing is where the passengers enter, where they're welcomed by staff. It's about their seating, how much room they have, how they interact with each other, how comfortable they are in the plane, if they're too warm or too cold. All that stuff is above wing. All the experience stuff is above wing. So below wing things can lead to a negative experience and above wing things can lead to a positive experience. So they should be looked at and managed very differently by the company in order to uh, attract and delight customers. So think about uh, where is the wing in your business, in your products or services? Which are the parts which you have to make sure never negatively affect the customer, which have to be right every time and you basically don't want them to even have to think about it. And which are the parts where you want to be a little in their faces with and to get to that point where they expect and get a great experience every time. Think about it. Now, if you wrote down a couple of ideas, that's great because we're going to be diving into this in the group discussions later. The third company I want to talk to you about is a, a, a classic example from a classic management book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. And this company is called Granite Rock. And Granite Rock did something very cool in their interaction with their customers. When they delivered a product or service and you got the bill, it said that if you were unsatisfied with anything for any reason, you could circle that item write down what was wrong and pay the remainder of the bill. This is called by Collins and others a red flag mechanism. See, it's easy in, in managing and reporting to kind of you know, measure things in such a way that you'll eventually have to do something about them, but it's not really in your face. Well, a red flag mechanism is really in your face and it doesn't get more red flag than this straight punch to the bottom line you've delivered the product or service and you don't get paid if the customer is not perfectly satisfied and this is a very very um, strong mechanism to ensure that it's clearly visible throughout the organization if somebody effed up if things aren't exactly as they should be according to the customer who really is the final judge of that. So think about Granite Rock, think about the courage of implementing such a red flag mechanism and what might serve in your business as a way to really put front and center if a customer is not satisfied. You don't want to be overwhelmed by angry customers, but the call center, option five, wait for 10 minutes and then have somebody with a script who kind of attenuates the criticism is not the way to get great feedback. This might be. 
So we have looked at three very different companies and very different ways to think about, measure and manage customer experience. Take some notes and then we are going to dive into the next segment, um, which is on um, making subjective experience objective and creating actionable reporting. See you there. Okay, so self-critique here. I think the tempo, tone of voice, all that stuff was a lot better, a lot more suited to the content. I, like towards the end, I feel I lost it a bit. I had some hesitation, it slowed down too much, and I had to read from the screen in a not very elegant way. I can't keep that as, uh, as video material during the course, but um, no. Hmm. Got some people in the stream. Interesting. Ah, guys, okay. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put this stuff back here. Stop the podcast console. Stop the camera. And stop the capture utility. Now, oh. I don't have any peace of mind about this capture utility having done what I wanted it to do. So we're gonna figure this out. First up, I'm gonna change the window capture. Um, to the capture utility so that you guys can watch with me and see what is happening here. Okay, so we have a number of things that are listed, right? Now, if I press play on any of these, crickets, right? That's not good. That can't be good. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? To do, to do. Con library load. Oh, wait. Again, crickets on the second one. Now, let's see where these are on the computer because we might be able to open them directly. Okay, so now I've opened with File Explorer. Let's see. Okay, I can select my uh, Explorer window for you here. Just give me a second. Okay, I'm opening MP4 file. Oh wait, something is happening there. Oh my goodness. Wow, okay, you gotta see this guys. Um, I'm gonna... Store. So, which app do we have here? This is movies and TV. Okay. Um, Microsoft stuff. Explorer, okay, that's the Explorer window. So th some things were captured, but oh my goodness, it looks horrible. It looks like some strange kind of interference. Um. AAF JSON. Okay, why would you create a JSON for that? But never mind. 
2 gigabytes, 6 gigabytes, dear me. Glad we have a new workstation because these are some intensely huge files. very strange I get some kind of weird impressionist painting stuff going on let's see if I can share this with you guys um, add a visual element media source add source um, add a new source we're gonna call it uh, recordings of doom Maybe a little dramatic, but you know. Okay. And then we're going to go to data storage disk, streams. And I'm going to put one of these up. Let's see. doesn't show up even streamlabs is like i don't know what you're trying to do dude but this file is not okay no bueno no bueno um try another one media source add source add new source local file We're back ish. Seem to have lost the uh, um, the screen capture. Let's see if we can get that back. Hey, neighbor, what's up? Good to see you, man. <laughs> You know what's going on next door, huh? What all the weird sounds mean. Hey, bro. Us. Let's 
my brother. Oh man, this is fun. Seems like the stream is now showing everybody who started to follow me recently, and that's pretty cool. Um, good to see you guys, all of you. Didn't work out. Yeah, I'm fairly sure about that. The window capture I have to configure. And let's put that back on Notion. That seemed to work just fine. Yes, okay. Now at least we have a decent um, something to show. Okay, well, the camera is still doing its job. Let me take you through some of the things we have here. So my main uh, recording camera is over here. It's a Nikon D7500. It is an excellent camera for static situations like this. It's really not the best camera for uh, shooting things that move around a lot because the autofocus of Nikon is not the best one out there. But this little cable here outputs HDMI um, 180p at like 50 hertz or something, um, which is really good. So you can get a high quality output from this camera into your capture card. And actually it's fairly cheap for what it does. Uh, it is a DSLR, you can get mirrorless cameras, which don't have this clicky mechanism inside, which will do really well for streaming. But because I love taking pictures in nature as well, this is the camera for me. Now around that you see the halo uh, light, which is an Elgato ring light. I have a lot of Elgato stuff. Uh, I really like it. It's, it's good quality stuff. This is what keeps my face evenly lit. And this is my minion speaker. I have speakers for little plants and they look like minions. Um, the green screen behind me is also uh, Elgato uh, hardware, as is the capture card in the workstation. So I do have a bunch of their stuff. And they recently, well, not so recently, they were bought out by Corsair, um, which used to be just making the memories that I put in my computer, but now makes most of the computers that we uh, that we use for this kind of stuff uh, great keyboards mice etc so i've i've basically boosted their stock or at least their turnover quite a bit uh, in setting up this business because it's uh, it's all pretty neat stuff um, another brand i'm a fan of is rode the the microphone and podcast console are, are rode as well as the arm that should be arriving any minute now. Um, so when it comes to like streaming gear, I like uh, Elgato Corsair stuff. When it comes to audio gear, I really like uh, Rode. Um, I also used Rode materials at Divetro, where I set up the Divetro Lente podcast, which had a couple thousand uh, listeners by the time I, uh, I ended my time there. So that was pretty good. Um, Overall, what you just want is you want high quality input so that you have to spend less time in, in, in post-processing to make it any good uh, to share it uh, with the world. So, um, yeah, that's uh, those are things. I, I, I used to use a MacBook Pro for this kind of thing. Uh, really good stuff. I, I like Macs, easy to use, all that. But it wasn't able to keep up with high definition streaming while also doing other things. So um, I had to make a choice there. I could go with the M1 Max, but um, the streaming software like uh, Streamlabs OBS, which is currently streaming this, is not optimized for M1 yet. There were uh, a number of other concerns. Um, video uses a crazy amount of storage. Like we just, Today, in this stream, 
generated well over 10 gigabytes, no problem. So I needed a system with a lot of memory, a lot of storage, a lot of real-time encoding capacity. When I looked at the math, it just didn't add up to get a, 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 math, a Mac for that. I am running a startup, so um, I went with a, a Windows computer again, which was actually not nearly as bad as I feared. Um, one funny thing, though, I don't run any Microsoft Office apps. It's all on more modern cloud-based apps like Notion, which you can see right here where I have the, the course materials in. I like Notion, so we have a, a, a seedling Notion for the, the shared business, and I have sharpest Notion, you know, for, for my own uh, stuff. So, like, I have uh, travel plans in there for... Uh, uh, if we're allowed to travel again, different things, uh, personal items, public items, um, items relating to Sharpstot, to this brand, like, you know, the template I use for interviews, brand assets like logos, etc. Um, things I use to create social media posts, everything I keep in, uh, in Notion. So that's a, that's a very useful app that helps me to, to produce this uh, content right now we go back to the one what that we were just recording this is one of the courses we're creating for the seedling academy check it out on uh, seedling.studio that's the website and uh, we're making these basically for founders that don't necessarily have to have founded their own business yet founders are more people with that mindset of you know i'm going to tackle this problem I'm not going to stop until I have a great solution that achieves impact at scale. Um, and those people are actually incredibly valuable to companies, but they're not always found, identified, and supported to be able to do their best work. And that's where, where we come in to provide that coaching, to provide some courses that really help both companies and the founders in that company um, to you know, get to what's next to identify the real innovation challenge, to develop a great solution for it, and to make sure that it has a business model, right? That it sells at scale and makes the lives of their um, their customers or their, their co-workers a lot better. Uh, and that's a lot of fun, really. I, uh, <laughs> I spent long days uh, doing that, sometimes in really like founder coaching, people who have started their own businesses as a spin out or, or, or on their own and uh, talking with corporates about how they do their innovation. And something that struck us, we were just talking about it earlier today is that actually um, a lot of things that are innovation challenges aren't seen as innovation challenges, right? They could be things around HR, or whatever, where it's like, yeah, but that's not technology, right? So it's not innovation. No, no, no. If you have a real problem that prevents you from doing your best work with your colleagues, and whether through a change in the process or a change in the team or a change in the way that you see what's going on there, um, as long as you're able to, you know, get out of your box to think about different solutions and then do something that hasn't been done before in that setting, um, but that either lowers the cost or makes it more frictionless or you know it leads, to, leads to better results in a different way, then then you are innovating. You know, um, some of the most meaningful innovations in history, also technological ones, are things like corrugated iron. You know, uh, uh, iron sheets were basically good for turning to rust until somebody had the idea to make them wavy so that it could carry greater loads and, and protect them with zinc against, uh, against rust. And suddenly it was like this huge construction material. I think there was even a, a wing added to a palace in England or something and corrugated uh, iron because it was, uh, you know, such a, a big deal. When it uh, when it first achieved scales, uh, scale, um, innovation can be really different things, and it's just it's a lot of fun for me to um, help people think about these problems in uh, in new ways. So that's why we're uh, creating course materials like this. Um, to be honest, 
my throat's kind of hoarse. I'm not used to uh, to this stuff yet. I'm going to end the stream soon. I'm going to see uh, if there are on any of the devices that have been recorded today any good materials that I can keep and uh, and continue working on. And maybe one of these days I'll do a live stream like while I'm editing video to show you guys a bit about that process. So thank you very much for, for watching, for following. Uh, we'll be back online and uh, we'll be continuing to build this digital business live. And uh, I hope you're watching. Thank you very much.